Hello class, I'm going to provide you uh, the online lecture for week six and these are medications that are prescribed for patients who have urinary retention, BPH, and UTIs. And the first medication that I want to talk about is Bethenicol and you might also know that know that medication uh, by the name of uracoline. Um, therapeutically, uh, bethenicol is a uh, medication for urinary retention. Uh, pharmacologically, it's a cholinergic agonist and a muscarinic uh, ag agonist. And this has been uh, approved since 1948, so it's been a medication that we've been using for quite a while. Um, it's an older med uh, available in tablet form. Um, it's used to treat urinary retention and to treat adynamic ileus and gastric um, uh, atony. And atony is when you do not have the um, tone to be able to uh, urinate. Uh, so this is why Benethal, uh, Beneth Bethenicol would be uh, prescribed for a patient. It's used um, to treat uh, a non-obstructive type of urinary retention. It acts directly with the uh, muscarinic receptors to cause body responses typical of parasympathetic stimulation. And basically what it does is it causes that detressor muscle to contract, making it easier uh, for a person to urinate. This can be administered, administered either PO or subcutaneously. And although it is poorly absorbed from the GI tract, it is usually administered orally, okay? Uh, when it's in, administered by the subcutaneous route, the dose is five milligrams, um, three to four times more per day is needed. And with um, bethenicol, it's necessary to monitor blood pressure and respirations uh, before administration and for at least one hour after the subcutaneous route. So let's talk about adverse uh, effects. Those side effects from bethenicol are predicted from its uh, parasympathetic actions. And those are such things as uh, increased uh, salvation, uh, salivation, um, salivation, abdominal cramping, um, sweating, flushing of the skin, meiosis, blurred vision, nausea and vomiting. And one of the more serious uh, problems that we see with uh, bethenicol is um, orthostatic hypotension that may also have possible syncope associated with it. Um, other things such as bradycardia, reflex tachycardia, uh, complete heart plaque, block, and acute bronchospasms. It's very important to get a very, very thorough uh, medical history on your patients because you need to know um, some things about their um, history related to their GI tract. And what I mean by that is we would definitely use caution with patients who might have a suspe suspected bowel obstruction, recent GI surgery, an active ulcer, or any type of GI inflammatory disease. We would definitely um, not use um, in a situation where a person has had uh, recent urinary surgery, uh, cystitis, uh, asthma, COPD, MI, uh, bradycardia, uh, hypotension, hypertension, and hyperthyroidism, and peritonitis, or even a history of Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy. If uh, a person happens to take more than the prescribed dosage of bethenicol, we can give atropine sub-Q.
and the safety of administering uh, bethenicol to children younger than um, eight years of age has not truly been established or researched um, fully. Interactions uh, with uh, other drugs uh, might be that um, you might have an increased cholinergic effect from a medication such as um, colon uh, esterase inhibitors and decreased uh, cholinergic effects from meds such as procanamide, um, quinidine, atropine, and epinephrine. Benethenicol has also um, uh, seen to cause an increase in um, uh, lab values such as AST, uh, amylase, and lipase. Cholinergic effects caused by bethenicol may be antagonized by angel's uh, trumpet, um, ginseng weed, or uh, scop scopolia, which are types of herbs. So um, very, very important to also um, be aware of what type of uh, herbal uh, supplement your patient is taking. And as I said before, atropine is a specific antidote and subcutaneous injection of atropine is preferred uh, except in emergencies when the IV route may be used and if the patient does have IV access. So that's bethenicol, used uh, to treat urinary retention and some of our patients who have um, gastric um, atony, which is that lack of muscle tone in order for one to be able to uh, to urinate. All right, the next medication that we're going to talk about is finasteride. And finasteride is also known as Proscar. Uh, therapeutically, it's used for uh, BPH. And um, pharmacologically, it's an antiandrogen or a 5-alpha reductase uh, inhibitor. Um, it's used to treat BPH, which is benign prostatic uh, hypertrophy. And it's used to um, help shrink the enlarged prostate and make it easier for uh, a, a man to be able to urinate. It is also used for propecia, which is uh, a fancy term for hair loss. And it can also be used uh, for uh, mild to moderate hirsutism in uh, female patients. It has known to be a uh, possibly against prostate cancer. However, the manufacturer who makes finasteride doesn't really state this. Uh, finasteride has been approved since 1992. And uh, when uh, you use it for uh, the purpose of BPH, then it's prescribed five times uh, the dosage uh, for BPH rather than for these other um, alternative uh, prescriptions uh, such as Propecia and hirsutism. Um, what it does is it uh, inhibits 5-alpha reductase, which is the enzyme responsible for converting testosterone to one of its metabolites, 5-alpha-dehydrotestosterone. Um, um, the active metabolite causes proliferation of prostate cells and promotes enlargement of the gland, and it also promotes regression of the prostate epithelial tissue and dec decreases that mechanical obstruction of the urethra, making it easier for someone to uh, be able to obviously urinate. So what are some of the adverse effects, um, which I think is really important that we teach the patient about because these are not very um, acceptable, especially for gentlemen. Um, and one of the big adverse effects is a sexual dysfunction, such as impotence, uh, dim diminished libido, and um, decreased uh, ejaculatory amount. Also, they may uh, develop gynecomastia, which are swollen male breast tissues, and also reduce sperm production and impaired fertility. Um, 
Um, and then you um, can possibly see some of the other types of less severe uh, adverse or side effects that occur. Headache, uh, nausea, dizziness, um, just feeling physically weak, lack of energy. Uh, remember, any male over 55 years of age is always at risk for prostate cancer. The one thing that you have to remember about finasteride is um, it should not be handled by any female who is pregnant uh, because um, it can actually be absorbed through the skin and damage uh, the fetus, especially if it's a male baby. So wearing gloves for anyone who administers finasteride should also uh, be implemented as well. Um, caution in patients with any type of renal and hepatic uh, uh, problems. Anticholinergics will decrease the effects of, of finasteride. And use with testosterone also decreases the effects of both meds. And again, looking at what herbal um, supplements your patients take. So uh, saw uh, palmetto potentiates the effects of finasteride, and there really is no treatment uh, for overdose. Um, this also should not be used for women who are breastfeeding or lactating, and um, you should also not donate blood while you're on this drug as well, because it can be um, detected in um, the uh, the blood that is being done. It's also important to um, explain to the patients who are prescribed finasteride that it may take three to six months for maximum effect. It peaks in about one to two hours after administration and lasts for about five to seven days. Um, when giving it orally, uh, the tablets may be crushed for oral administration. And again, um, do not... Uh, uh, have any pregnant woman or any woman that's lactating um, um, handle this drug because, as I said, it can um, be absorbed through the skin into the bloodstream, okay? Um, and again, to remind the patients that while they're on this, they should not donate blood, okay? So that's finasteride. All right, the next drug uh, that we're going to talk about is um, we're kind of switching gears here and discussing some of the meds that you might see ordered for um, UTIs. And we can kind of look at these urinary tract infections and kind of um, put them in a category of either complicated or uncomplicated UTIs. And what we need to know what those terms really refer to is usually... Um, a um, uncomplicated uh, UTI is uh, really just uh, a type of um, UTI that really um, responds well to antibiotics. There's usually no structural involvement um, involved and um, really um, doesn't uh, potentiate the infection or the organism. Um, causing some more serious complications to occur, such as sepsis and uh, secondary um, opportunist infections. Usually your complicated ones are more uh, dependent on the organism, and usually they're due to structural problems. And obviously it does depend on the health history of the patient behind it, making it more of a complicated urinary tract infection. Uh, Ciprofloxacin is an antibacterial uh, medication. It's also in the fluoroquinolone uh, family. Um, it's pharmacologically a bacterial DNA replication inhibitor. And this has been approved since 1987. And Cipro uh, is basically the second generation, more effective with gram-negative organisms. Um, it can be given uh, PO, IV, or ophthalmic. Uh, we use this for patients who might have corneal ulcers or even conjunctivitis. And um, we also see it uh, uh, used uh, with children with um, otitis media who might be six months or younger. Um, it's also used for 
uh, UTIs, sinusitis, uh, some pneumonias, skin, bone, and joint infections, um, infectious diarrhea, uh, such as Shigella, um, involving the small bowel. Um, it is a broad-spectrum antibiotic, most effective against gram-negative organisms, organisms such as Enterobacter, uh, Citrobacter, E. coli, Hemophilus, uh, uh, Kipsiella, uh, Proteus, Staphylococcus, Shigella, Salmonella, Neisseria, and Serratia. Uh, there is a prophylaxis of inhalational R, and if you remember back many years ago, uh, there was a um, um, a concern that there was going to be a terrorist attack uh, involving some kind of um, organisms, and they were worried that uh, we were going to be um, subjected to anthrax. Well, when um, our government heard that, they asked the manufacturer of ciprofloxacin to make large, large, massive quantities. And so ciprofloxacin is the drug used to treat um, anthrax as well. Um, so, um, and, and some of you yourself probably have been on it. It does inhibit bacterial DNA uh, gyrase and uh, topiosomerase. Um, Ciprofloxacin affects bacterial replication and DNA repair. Um, it's usually considered a bacterial cytal and inhib exhibits a prolonged post antibiotic effect. All right. It really is used for a lot, a lot of, of, of infections. Of course, with any um, antibiotics, it's always important to definitely assess your patient's renal function because these are um, the, the, the main um, route in which these uh, antibiotics are excreted. Um, always know what other medications your patients are on, especially if they're on any anticoagulants, especially Coumadin or warfarin, because being on ciprofloxacin will increase the effects of warfarin and make your patients more at risk for bleeding. For the most part, um, Cipro is, is pretty well t tolerated by most people. Uh, usually, um, we see people develop um, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea usually in about 20% of the patients who are prescribed uh, ciprofloxacin. Um, so it's really recommended that they take this drug uh, with food to hopefully decrease some of those GI problems. Um, but you need to educate the patient that they should not uh, take this drug with antacids or any mineral supplements because the absorption of that drug will be, uh, you know, significantly uh, diminished, the absorption. Um, some patients also report um, phototoxicity, uh, headache, dizziness. Um, the big black warning with Cipro is that it can cause tendinitis and tendon rupture uh, in patients of any age. And risk is especially high in patients who are over uh, 60 years of age. Um, in kidney, heart, and lung transplant recipients and those uh, receiving concurrent uh, corticosteroid, uh, corticosteroid therapy. Uh, fluoroquinolones may cause adverse muscle weakness in patients with myasthenia gravis as well. So important to know that. Um, the use with xanthines, remember we talked about xanthines with our respiratory patients, like menthol xanthines, like aminophylline. So anybody that's using it with xanthines, caffeine, theophylline, and theobromine, um, slow the hepatic metabolism of these drugs. So if an overdose occurs while on a Cipro, uh, you just treat the symptoms of what's occurring with the patient. Again, assess medical history, assess vital signs, and of, of course, know what your patient's allergies are and, um, you know, really assess their GI function as well to uh, see if they're um, having, um, 
you know, that nausea and vomiting and be sure that they're not taking something like an antacid to um, counteract those um, feelings of nausea or even um, GI disturbances. So that's Cipro, Ciprofloxacin. Very common antibiotic that we use quite often to treat all those various infections. All right, um, class, the next um, drug that I want to talk about is your uh, trimethoprim, your sulfa, methoxazole. And these are commonly like your Bactrim and your Septra, which have been around for such a long time. Um, this group of antibiotics are obviously therapeutically antibacterial, and pharmacologically they are folic acid inhibitors, um, sulfonamides. <clears throat> this um, group of medications uh, was approved back in 1973, been around for a long, long time, can be even given PO or IV. Um, Uh, prophylactic for um, UTIs and uh, treats um, prophylactic uh, a pneumocystitis carina or treats uh, uh, pneumonia. Uh, that Jerevishi, that's for patients that, um, you know, um, have a weakened immune system. And we did talk about this somewhat in um, Nursing 121 when we talked about our exemplar of pneumonia. Hopefully you guys remember that. Um, remember... Um, a pneumocystitis is a type of infection of the lungs in people with that weakened immune system, and it's caused by yeast-like fungus called uh, pneumocystitis gerovici. And usually people with healthy immune systems don't get this type of uh, pneumonia. It is, it is somewhat rare, okay? And how that is uh, basically diagnosed is by um, uh, doing a bronchoscopy on the patient and uh, getting a sample of sputum or fluid that's been removed from the lung. Uh, so then they can um, do a CNS on that, determine what organism is causing that particular uh, type of pneumonia. All right. Um, It's also used for Shigella infections of the small bowel, traveler's diarrhea due to E. coli, and used for acute exacerbations of patients with chronic bronchitis uh, due to streptococcus pneumonia or hemophilus influenza. Okay. Um, when given uh, the oral route, um, it's encouraged that uh, uh, patients... Um, Take that with a full glass of water. Um, and it's important that, uh, again, to review the medications that your patients are on. Um, some of the serious uh, side effects that you really need to watch out for when they're on these types of medications is... Um, skin rashes. And the one that is a very serious one is your Steven Johnson syndrome, where um, it really is more of an epidermal necrolysis. Um, so it's really important to really evaluate um, skin integrity. Um, sometimes we have seen um, a granulocytosis, a plastic anemia, um, and allergic myocarditis. Um, should not be used with sulfites. 
uh, sulfonamides, thiazide diuretics, and definitely use cautiously with anticoagulants and potassium sparing diuretics such as um, aldactone and potassium supplements. Obviously, nausea and vomiting are most frequent side effects and definitely use with caution in patients with um, chronic kidney disease. Um, it may cause crystal, crystalluria, oliguria, and kidney failure have been reported. And then again, photosensitivity uh, um, is also been reported and to encourage um, people to avoid that direct sunlight. Obviously not to prescribe if sensitive to sulfonamides and patients with documented um, megaloblastic uh, anemia due to folate deficiency should not be prescribed this drug and do not take if uh, pregnant or nursing. It may cause uh, connectoris, uh, which is when um, newborns um, develop um, jaundice due to the breakdown of red blood cells and it can actually cause brain damage. Um, decreased potassium excretion so should not be taken with, um, with uh, a patient who has hyperkalemia as well. With your uh, sulfomethoxazole, um, groups of medication interactions uh, could uh, have an effect with certain anticoagulants. Uh, phenoyton toxicity may occur, so use with cautions when patients are taking uh, spironolactone because it is a potassium sparing drug. Um, do not take potassium supplements and um, and if there's any indication of uh, bone marrow suppression um, or treatment of an OD, administer 5 to 15 milligrams of leucovorin either IV or oral. All right, uh, your next uh, group of medications are your um, nitrofurantoin um, macrocrystals, and those are meds such as Macrobid or Macrodantin, um, used for uncomplicated acute cystitis. Um, these are therape therapeutically used for antibacterials, or pharmacologically they're um, classified as urinary tract antiseptics. Uh, for the treatment of acute cystitis and prophylactically for recurring UTIs. Um, when bacteria breaks down macrobid, it is converted to a highly reactive intermediate, and these intermediates attack that bacterial ribosomal uh, proteins, and it definitely uh, inhibits protein synthesis and aerobic energy metabolism, DNA synthesis, and RNA synthesis, and the formation of the cell wall with that particular bacteria. And Bacrobid is uh, bactericidal in the urine at therapeutic levels. Um, some of the adverse effects, again, any, with any of these antibiotics, you're going to get these GI problems of nausea and vomiting. Uh, headache, anorexia. The one thing with this group of medications is it can cause pulmonary um, toxicity and this may not occur immediately but may occur from months to years later such as a pneumonitis and you know kind of exhibit as a pneumonitis or a persistent cough or even um, be um, kind of manifested as pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it can cause uh, hepatotoxicity and use cautiously in renal patients and pregnant pregnant women and of kids and of course kids under one month of age. Again, assess medical uh, history, uh, vital signs, and of course renal and um, liver function as well. Um, and one thing that's really important that um, assess urinary output, color, etc. Make sure the patient is avoiding uh, adequately um, and make sure the patient is taking in adequate fluid. Um, so if you see that the patient is developing what we call oliguria, which is little urine or under 500 mLs in a 24-hour period, or anuria, 
<clears throat> excuse me, which is no urine, then um, then you need to stop the medication because um, urine is needed um, in order for the drug to um, be effective and work. Should not be given with antacids containing magnesium due to decreased absorption. And um, some of the, uh, if the patient happens to be on another antibiotic, such as a um, fluoroquinolone, quinolone, which is um, Cipro, may result in uh, antagonism and decreased drug effect. Okay. Um, watch the IV site if the patient is getting these um, um, through uh, the IV route because it cause, can, can also cause um, irritation to the site as well. With this group of medications, with the nitrile furantoins, um, there is three formulations, and I didn't put this on the PowerPoint, but um, I probably won't ask this on the test, but I just wanted to kind of give you this information because you might see this. Um, the first one is the microcrystalline form, which is your furodantin. And the second one is um, your macrodantin, which are regular release uh, macrodant, uh, micro, macrocrystalline form. And then the third one is the sustained release uh, macrocrystalline or the macrobit form. And the macrocrystalline form is more slowly absorbed than the micro, and that produces fewer GI related adverse reactions. Um, you really want to be careful with this group, especially if your patients have any pre-existing pulmonary diseases or any type of hepatic disease. Um, but the important thing is to do good patient teaching and to definitely make sure that the patient is taking adequate fluid because you want the patient to produce um, adequate urine um, because this is how the drug works, okay? Um, because we're trying to treat this uh, cystitis, and cystitis is just a fancy name for a bladder infection, all right? So that's the nit nitrofurantoin, okay? And then the last one I want to talk about is your amoxicillin. And this is a pretty popular uh, group of antibiotics. Uh, broad spectrum penicillin. Uh, we use it to treat sepsis, upper respiratory, and uh, genital, genital, genital urinary tract infections. Again, you get all these GI problems, sometimes stomach pain, headache. And because we're blowing out, knocking out that normal flora in the vaginal area, patients may start to get some um, vaginal um, infections causing irritation or discharge or itching. Rash, uh, rashes have been noted, swollen black or hairy tongue should also be observed as well. Um, but for the most part, people do pretty good on your amoxicillins as well. Um, like I said, uh, this is a really very popular group of uh, antibiotics to treat um, um, these UTIs. And, uh, you know, it, it's pretty inexpensive as well. And that's what you want to always look out for. Um, what antibiotic can really treat that infection that is economical for your patients? Because some of these um, that obviously I haven't talked about are sometimes ordered for your patients, which um, cost your patients astronomical amounts, amounts of money. So just be aware of that, especially when the patients go home and they have to fill their prescriptions and, you know, take it for, you know, seven to 10 days because it's really important that when patients do go home on this or if they're given this out of the patient at the doctor's office, that they take the full course of antibiotics. There's a lot of new um, research done on UTIs, especially patients who have reoccurring uh, cystitis. Usually if that uh, occurs more than two times a year, um, it's necessary to find out if there's some kind of structural problem um, because um, you can end up with, uh, um, you know, irreversible kidney problems if that organism um, tends to um, kind of, uh, you know, travel upwards into the kidney. Uh, so a lot of times what they'll do is they'll order um, like a cystoscopy and kind of look into the bladder to see if there is kind of like a dormant um, organism up there that kind of just flares up from time to time causing the person to develop an exacerbation of an infection. And uh, 
if anybody's ever had uh, urinary tract infections or a cystitis, um, it's a very, very uncomfortable situation and people can get very, very ill from that. So um, when the diagnosis is made, and usually it's by the symptoms, fever, and of course um, it's important to get a specimen to definitely culture the urine um, and see what organism is causing the infection, but many times patients will have extreme uh, manifestations of a UTI, frequency, burning, sometimes hematuria, frequency, I mean just all kinds of um, very serious um, symptoms which um, makes the person feel uh, very ill, lack of appetite, general malaise, so it's important to get that diagnosis made right away and to definitely um, get them on the correct antibiotic um, because you know, in the elderly patient who maybe has a decrease of uh, intake, um, it's very common for UTIs to occur, especially in the female patient. Um, and most of those are caused by E. coli. And uh, urinary tract infections are nothing to mess with because sometimes they can eventually evolve into a um, sep urosepsis, which... Um, we have seen patients actually die from that. So um, we got to get them on an antibiotic and then we have to assess the patient's um, uh, effects of the antibiotic and just make sure that we're teaching them all these specifics related to that antibiotic and make sure that they're taking the full dosage and then to report some of these potential uh, problems that may occur because we can get them off of a, a certain you know, classification of antibiotics and put them on something else. But we really need to, um, you know, eradicate that organism because urinary tract infections are really nothing to mess with. Um, and then if we see this happening frequently to a patient, then we have to investigate further. And the doctors usually will to see why the patient is, you know, unfortunately having reoccurring UTIs. Uh, because you don't want to be on antibiotics if you don't need to. Because remember, they are good in treating some of these organisms, but remember, they can knock out the normal flora in some of these different um, systems. And again, we don't want to put our patients at risk for developing vaginal infections. And of course, we worry about if they're on one or two antibiotics that, uh, you know, they might develop, you know, C. diff or something like that. Uh, because we've kind of messed up that whole um, microbes um, in the uh, GI tract, in the gut. So, um, I hope this helps a little bit, and I know with your Nursing 122 lecture, you're going to get some more information on um, UTIs and urinary retention because, of course, we don't want urinary retention to occur because that stasis of urine up in the urine is up in the bladder is obviously a very um, good media for um, bacteria to thrive and grow. And this is why we uh, provide these medications. And you always want to suspect that any uh, man over 50 could possibly have some degree of BPH. It's just what happens because their testosterone levels start to fall. And this is why that prostate starts to enlarge and they start to have symptoms of frequency and, um, you know, um, urinary retention and they're getting up in the middle of the night and uh, this is why um, you know we see then um, they really don't get UTIs but what happens is they get an infection uh, more like prostatitis than UTIs. Women get UTIs because of just their anatomy but men don't that doesn't usually happen um, until after 50 when that prostate begins to enlarge and sometimes uh, you know some men just have a small enlargement that really is not extremely affected with urination but then there's some men that unfortunately have to be on medications to keep that prostate size down so there's not that obstructive um, type of situation happening where there's issues with um, voiding and you know developing urinary retention so uh, that's why it's important that men over 50 you know again you know have you know us women have to have you know pap test and mammograms and things like that. Men should really be uh, assessed with their prostate as well as their PSA levels and things like that. Because remember, any man over 55 is also uh, very much at risk for a prostate cancer as well. And it's a very curable cancer, but it's always important to diagnose those at a very, very early um, uh, 
time in the course of the development of that cancer. So um, I hope this helps a lot, but um, you know, we don't want to take these antibiotics for granted, but we have to kind of look at why uh, these patients are getting these UTIs. You know, is it just a matter of poor wiping and poor technique, or is there something bigger going on with these patients, okay? And some of the theories of, uh, you know, reoccurrent cystitis or UTIs are that maybe uh, the person needs to be on uh, antibiotics for at least three to six months to be sure that that bacteria that's causing the infection is totally gone and totally eradicated because they're finding out that really that seven or ten days of antibiotic treatment may not be enough. So, um, that's kind of the, the theory. So that's why we need to really educate our patients. You know, when you're finished with your prescribed regimen, are you still exhibiting symptoms? Do you feel like, you know, you're better and you're not having frequency and your urine isn't cloudy and you're, you know, it's not foul smelling and it's not burning when you're trying to urinate. So these are things that we need to teach our patient about. So I hope this helps and I appreciate your attention. And if you do have any questions, feel free to always email me. It's always great and hopefully we'll get to talk about some of these in our WebEx. Uh, enjoy your day and thanks again for your attention.